Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bacor here for episode 44. I'm back. Thanks to everybody who uh, wished me well for my vacation. Had a great couple of weeks down in Quito, Ecuador in South America. If you haven't been there, it's a beautiful place. Uh, we had a lot of fun visiting family and touring some of the sites. However, they do have a pretty bad smog problem from transportation mainly. Uh, as you can see by some of these pictures, there's a lot of buses that produce big black smoke down there and trucks and cars. Uh, they are slowly getting an infusion of newer vehicles with better emission controls, but there's still a lot of older stuff on the road and even those newer ones tend to belch out a lot of smoke. So there were times we were driving through the city which is about 70 kilometers long and about five kilometers wide, you can do the conversion to miles. So it's a long, narrow in a valley in between mountains. So smog is very easy to set in when there's no wind in that type of scenario. So there were some days where we had a little problem uh, with our breath of trying to not breathe in the smog and the uh, pollution. Uh, but it's, and they've got some mandates where they want to really clean up the rack by 2030 or 2025 or so. So things are changing. But anyway, thank you very much for everybody who wrote in and uh, said, hey, uh, have great holidays and hope uh, you're back. So I am back and I've got a few things to talk about in today's show. There were lots of things happened over the last couple of weeks that I won't necessarily get into because I was doing a lot of tweeting. If you're not following me on Twitter, please do, because I'm much more active on Twitter, especially in between shows where I'm trying to get people to look at different stories that I may not talk about on the show. So let me start off with one story, which I thought was quite interesting. I mentioned Ecuador and their challenges with transportation, pollution and air quality and so forth. Well, certainly India has, has a greater challenge. India has been in the news quite recently because of their general elections that they had the largest turnout ever for an election in human history with, I believe, over 600 million people voting out of the 1.3 billion that's in the population of the country of India. They're making great strides, of course, to clean up their air quality and try to implement sustainable transportation and energy where they can. It's a big, robust country with a lot of different geography parameters that you have to overcome and different um, costs and everything associated with that. But Panasonic, who we all know and love from producing batteries for the likes of Tesla, uh, are also going to start making charging uh, systems for uh, various fleets within the country of India. And they're looking to actually gain an early market share in this really starting to boom market. Panasonic's launched EV charging stations in the capital of New Delhi. Uh, it's a charging service called the Nimbus, which includes stations and battery swap stations. That seems to be something that they do for some smaller vehicles down there. The charging stations um, is, are going to cater to about 150 smart e-electric three-wheelers. Those are very popular in India on the roads and 25 uh, Q-Quick two-wheelers operating in that Delhi region. Now, Smarty uh, claims to be India's first and largest electric vehicle operator. They operate over a thousand electric vehicles today in Delhi and neighboring regions, and they plan to increase that tenfold, actually a hundredfold to a hundred thousand by 2023. So just within three years or so, they, they really want to ramp that up. And that's good for them because we all know that. Some of those motorcycles and scooters that are very popular in some of the Southeast Asian countries and elsewhere uh, aren't the best for pollutants, uh, for controlling pollutants and what they emit into the atmosphere. So if they can electrify those, that's a great way to, to uh, help reduce uh, emissions and greenhouse gases. India, uh, of course, has made some po political news a couple of years ago when they announced a target to sell uh, only electric vehicles by 2030, and that's only 11 years away, and that's a pretty grandiose target, so I really hope that they can make that. Quick start off with some good news about uh, the country of India. Again, it uh, doesn't get a lot of press, but it's 1.3 billion folks. It's an awful lot of people. Uh, those are really areas that we need to see electrification and sustainable transportation and sustainable energies happen. And I know it can be a challenge technically and socioeconomically and so forth, politically at times, but they are slowly taking steps. So very good for them and good to hear that news. I'm going to quickly jump into Tesla and some of the Model 3. I mean, it's selling like hotcakes, uh, you know, I know, so I'm not going to report on that every week. But one little story that caught my eye was they're doing so well in Norway, in fact, that that's the number one country right now 
in Europe that's leading in Tesla Model 3 sales since they've opened shipments to Europe that they're actually having problems. And I mean, as far as service problems, um, seems like the Model 3s are still getting delivered in, in a lot of bulk with minor quality issues like uh, paint job paint imperfections and scratches and dents and so forth. So nothing major, but just minor stuff. And people are trying to get these fixed and they're having a problem because there's not a lot of you know, service availability for this with this influx of more cars. So Norway um, has the most complaints uh, uh, per car <laughs> as far as uh, Tesla goes. Um, their units, their complaint units in 2018 uh, were more than three times higher now than, uh, than what they're seeing today. Sorry, what they're seeing today is three times higher than 2018. So something's happening. It's uh, plunged their service quality index, some rating that the uh, Norway, I think, automotive group provides for after sales service from fourth position down to 51st because of this. Now, it's not, uh, again, it's not unforeseen. You know, I knew that this was going to happen when you see an influx of vehicles and you've been reading about this in other reports and seeing it in, in other people, what they're talking about, that when you ship all of a sudden all these cars, there's going to be some initial issues. There's no doubt about that. But Tesla's been trying to deliver these Model 3s as quick as they could to get them out the door, but if, I think there's a bit of a cost of quality associated with that, that their quality is slipping a little bit again because there's, there's you know, much more reports of imperfections. Um, but, you know, the... Uh, Tesla is trying to double uh, service staff. They're opening new service centers. They're running double shifts even in these centers and expanding mobile service teams to combat um, the, the large amount of issues. Now, they have over 40,000 cars in country. About 7,000 or plus already have been Model 3 uh, new imports just in the last couple of months. So they've definitely got their handful. Now, I certainly expect the quality to improve and things to settle down. But it's just something to, something to be aware of if you're in one of these countries now that have just are starting to receive new Model 3 orders um, over the last couple of months or in the near future. Just be aware that you may run into some minor issues because of some of these quality issues that Tesla still seems to have. But it is doing very well. And I know everybody that I talk to regardless of uh, most people there's a few that are very perturbed about some of these problems but most people are quite happy with the vehicle and expect these problems and, and tesla does do a really good job at trying to resolve them as quickly as they can now sticking with the model 3 i generally don't report a lot on uh, what other reviewers do but i do like and watch alex on autos from time to time he does a great job and he's come out with a report that um, he did some really strict analysis on a Tesla Model 3 standard edition that he's purchased for himself and trying to figure out the range and how close it matches the EPA stated range of 220 miles. And after a lot of testing, um, now weather did, would, did not play a factor in his testing, and if you can go over and watch his, his full depth video of it, but I just wanted to summarize um, his findings that um, in his real world test, which was pretty accurate, um, it's causing obviously quite an uprising because he's reporting that he's only getting about 192 miles of range, not 240 miles. And that's, uh, you know, 50 miles or so of uh, almost 50 miles of difference. And you can convert that to kilometers. Uh, that's fairly substantial. I mean, it's not mind blowing, but it's fairly substantial. The difference now, um, you know, he's a pretty smart guy. He does things very methodical. So I give him the utmost respect and credit that, uh, if he's come out with some findings that I believe that it's truly credible and that he's done a lot of work for those. And I haven't watched the video, but, you know, reading some of the comments below, people are saying, ah, if you baby the car and you, you put it in chill mode and stuff like that, you might, you know, you'll get that kind of mileage. But hey, most people don't. They like to floor it all the time. I don't think that's a good practice, folks. I didn't get an electric car so I can drive the crap out of it all the time and floor it all the time that's going to cause a problem at some point. You're going to get yourself into a jam at some point by doing that. So you can come to your own conclusions about that, but it just seems that there's a little bit of, of difference now that pe some people are finding real world versus EPA. And now we know EPA is not exact either, but it seems to be one of the best measurements from an MPG and a, and a range perspective from electricity goes. EPA seems to be the most most closest, I guess, to a reality, but nothing's going to be perfect because everybody's driving style is different. Their geography, the terrain, the weather, there's a whole bunch, thousands of attributes really that can impact driving range on any car, be it gas or electric. So you got to take these with a little bit of a generalized view. But Alex on autos uh, did find that he's lacking on range. So 
Um, you know, most people I've talked to, I have talked to some people with the long range Model 3 that are able to get 500 kilometers out of it, which is fantastic. If you have some comments you want to throw on that, again, I'm not bashing this. I'm just reporting that that's what he's finding. I'd like to hear your comments. And uh, again, just something to take, something to be aware of that all cars uh, are going to be a little bit off from their EPA range. But anyway, your mileage will vary, as we always say, in the EV world. Quickly move on to some other car manufacturers from Audi. They've released, uh, so the Euro NCAP has released some crash tests, uh, which you can see here going on behind me on the Audi e-tron, the Audi e-tron, which you can't get yet in Canada. It's coming, folks. And I know it's constrained in a lot of other parts of the world. But the good news is it received a five star in those crash tests. And, you know, the um, the Euro cap uh, Euro NCAP tests are pretty good. I fact, in fact, I may even think they're better than the IHS ones here in North America that we rely on. They're just as good, if not even better, on some of their, their tests uh, that they do because they do a lot of avoidance stuff as well, which I don't see down here. Uh, so for the uh, e-tron to score five stars is a pretty, pretty solid feat. Um, some of the numbers coming out of that, um, it for adult occupancy received a 91% rating. Child 85, uh, vulnerable road users 71, so I guess 70, you know, biking or crossing the street or something, and safety assist 76%. Now remember, this is a pretty heavy vehicle with at uh, over 2,500, almost 2,600 kilograms. You can do the math for pounds. Um, so it's got some substance to it. Now for comparison, the uh, Jaguar I-Pace um, also received a five-star uh, Euro NCAP rating, uh, 91 for adult safety, 81 for child, 73 for vulnerable road users, and 81% for safety assist. Excuse me. So good to see that we're starting to see more stats on that. And as we know, uh, myself and you viewers out there and people that are following the electric vehicle movement for a while, that EVs are generally safer than ICE vehicles because of some of the additional rigidity that the packs and the structures and everything add to it. So it's all good news. And I uh, really hope to get my hands on an e-tron maybe this summer or fall. They might have some press ones here in Canada. Uh, I know I've seen some of my friends in Europe get their hands and starting to drive some stuff around there because their delivery started a few months ago. So I look forward to that and I look forward to continued success from Audi. Now Chevrolet, we know that they've axed the Volt. They stopped producing there. So right now the only true EV they have in their uh, fully battery EV they have in their lineup is the Chevy Bolt with a B. But obviously some spy shots, We I think I mentioned some announcements from them a couple shows ago, but that they are coming out with something a little bit bigger. It's based on a Chevrolet Bolt. Uh, they call it an EUV, which is, I think, an electric utility vehicle. I don't know. This Everybody's making up their own acronyms now, CUV, SUV, all this other stuff that's out there. They're just adding to it. Um, but there's a derivative of that. Uh, so they're, right now the press is calling it the Chevrolet Bolt EUV. So it's a little bit bigger. And here's some pictures of it going uh, camouflage, uh, under camouflage while doing some tests on public roads. Uh, people cameras are out there. Um, it's more a little bit of a smaller crossover type of vehicle, um, which is good because, as I've mentioned many times, that's a hot, hot, hot market. Um, ex expected that this uh, vehicle will use a modified and upgraded platform of the existing Bolt, so not the exact same platform, but slightly modified and upgraded. And that platform, that modified platform, could be then the standard for future electric vehicles from General Motors, could be that platform that they will move forward with. Um, we expect that this will have a higher capacity battery than the original Bolt um, because of the size and the market it's going after. We do expect it to have a little bit bigger battery. I don't know what. I, uh, right now the Bolt's in the 60th range, so maybe a 72, 75, who the heck knows. Um, it should have some faster charging because the current Bolt is limited to 50 kilowatt charging for DC fast charging under CCS. Um, but, you know, it's not far to, out of the limelight to assume that that could get bumped up to 100 because that seems to be where manufacturers are now going up into that 100, 125, 150 kilowatt charging, fast charging range. So stay tuned for more information on that. But it is very good to see GM continuing to try to do something because uh, they really need to step it up again. They have... You know, they've, they've got a great product in the Bolt. They had a very good product in the Volt. Now that they've got rid of that, they really need to fill that gap. And they've announced uh, electrification as part of their strategy. So let's wait and see what happens. And staying with spy shots and manufacturers, Mercedes-Benz with their EQB now. So it's a smaller version of the EQC, which is now shipping in various parts of the of the globe. 
Um, it's stated to have up to 500 kilometers or 310 miles of WLTP range. Again, they Mercedes has committed to under the uh, EQC under the EQ brand, excuse me, to launch a whole series of fully, both fully electrified and partially electrified vehicles, so plug-in hybrid and and fully uh, battery-only vehicles under that brand. This is another of those vehicles which should be coming out in the not so distant future. Uh, related to, uh, basically to the Mercedes-Benz GLB gas con gas vehicle, so um, uh, and even it could come in a hybrid form, plug-in hybrid form as well. I mentioned the range. Um, that's all there is. There really isn't no, any specs, pricing, anything like that. So uh, good for Mercedes. I just hope they can really start spinning up uh, deliveries of the EQC because it's getting great reviews from the ones that I'm seeing. I haven't had a chance to drive it. I've seen it before, but I haven't had a chance to road test it myself. But uh, I fully ex fully expect it to be a great vehicle at the price point and the brand that it represents. Uh, it should be by all by all means. So Mercedes doesn't do things lightly. Uh, so good. So keep your eye on this and maybe uh, some of the other uh, spy shots that might be coming out from it. And I'm sure that they'll do. They will be debuting this at a later car show, maybe late in the fall, when some of those bigger ones ramp up. We'll have to wait and see. Last article for the show is uh, something a little bit different. I cover, you know, electric ferry boats, electric, uh, I haven't talked about electric airplanes because they're starting to come up, but certainly different types of uh, use for electrification from trucks and delivery vehicles and sort. Well, here's another one from Loomis. Um, it's actually for Loomis, a company called Exos Trucks, formerly Thor Trucks. I remember Thor Trucks. I guess maybe they uh, wanted to change their name <laughs> because of Marvel. Who, who knows? I don't know. But they've now uh, produced an all-electric uh, Class 8. It's a truck for one of their, their armored cars, basically, for increasing uh, financial transfers cash handling vehicles is what they call them and they've uh, built uh, two all-electric uh, vehicles right now that are that are production ready prototypes I guess production vehicles and they're being uh, piloted right now by Loomis Armored US which is one of the biggest armored car services in North America Loomis and this is a great application for fully electrification because, you know, these armored vehicles typically don't do long distances. They're doing more short haul urban runs or within a, within a shorter range. And they often sit idling because these guys never turn their car off, especially when they're making a delivery. So they always keep things running. So that's, you know, sometimes they'd be idling for 10, 15 minutes. Who the heck knows? Um, so with these things being fully uh, battery only, you won't have that idling. And typically because of the weight, of these vehicles combined with the idling and the short distances they typically don't get good fuel economy they're big diesels so again adding to zero emissions uh, i think primarily they're going to be launched in california uh, for loomis uh, initially for these uh, thousand if they uh, if they are for these hundred if they take them up on it uh, if you happen to see one roaming the streets let me know let me know what you think but uh, good again just good to see electrification expanding into other areas all right, one last piece is mailbag I wanted to get into, and uh, I really, really appreciate mail and comments. As I mentioned, I was checking while I was on holidays. Um, everybody it was a few mails that came in, some comments. I appreciate all that as always. Now, this is me. Uh, this is a, an email I got from Peter back in the early part of May, and Peter. I don't, I don't believe you said where you're from, but I think you're from the Poland area, if I've got that right. But I could be wrong, and if I'm wrong, I apologize. But certainly somewhere in Europe, and it's a long email. And Peter was just basically, you know, alluding to the fact that you know he's on user groups and Facebook and chats and all this kind of stuff, and he's he's still continuing to run into a lot of. Um, a lot of people that just don't understand the electric landscape and what electrification can bring to the world. And they, they still think that electrification is not a good way to move forward with consumer and sustainable transportation. So they have, they have a lot of negativity towards that. Um, you know, and he's he's had some conversations with people online and things like that. And he's asked me to talk about it just to kind of not set the record straight because folks, I'm no expert on this. There are other people that have much more highly qualified data material that they can talk about about the full gamut of you know uh, well to wheel aspects of electrified vehicles I've, I've read some studies i've read some reports i'm seeing more and more intel come out that substantiate the positive side of electrified cars and elect uh, electrified transport then there are negative now of course one of those things depends on where your energy is coming from so if you're coming from a really heavy dirty coal producing area 
that then the benefits of an electrified vehicle are not going to be there. You're going to probably be causing more harm than you are good because of where your energy is generated. But in a lot of other countries that are uh, introducing more cleaner energy methods like uh, more hydro, more solar, more wind and so forth, we could argue the, narrow, the merits of nuclear. I know it's I'm not a huge fan, but um, nuclear is much safer than it was 50 years ago and a lot of, there is transitioning going on with nuclear to denuclearize and to move into some of those sustainable areas so it is happening but that takes time because you're talking about decades to shut down a plant and migrate things out so but but you know we are taking those steps forward um, you know he's talking about and he you know he, he and he, he knows that the electrification is a almost a generational push this isn't happening tomorrow this is a slow transition you know we're only at two percent market share commercial wise from last year maybe we'll get to four percent this year i mean we might start seeing a doubling effect who knows but still a whole ton of way to go on this so this is decades long process that we'll see from uh, electrification um, and of course battery production is getting better and better and more and more recycling places are popping up and businesses are starting in order to handle you know, in the next five, six, seven years, as these electrified vehicles start becoming, you know, getting out of warranty and people want to get rid of them and go to new cars, what do you do with these battery packs? Well, there's a lot of companies, including a lot of the manufacturers, are going to take these vehicles back and either repurpose, refresh, and repurpose these batteries into other applications like vehicle to grid and so forth, vehicle to home, or um, or into areas of, of fully recycling them. And they're, they're, they're finding ways to get much more efficient where they can, these packs become highly recyclable and they do control any dangerous elements. So, so there are a lot of positive uh, happening on this, but, you know, um, so I talked about the charging them and the issues about, you know, obviously it depends on where you are. So if somebody's saying, look at, you know, it's EVs aren't good. Well, yeah, again, if you've got old coal, they're not going to be the greatest. Some people are saying hydrogen cars are the future, not electric cars. So why make electric cars now? Well, I tend to disagree with that. I, I don't have enough positive evidence that hydrogen is the future. I know that there are some car analysts out there that will argue that till they further with their last breath that hydrogen is the future. I wish it was. I really do because it is very efficient and extremely clean. Um, I don't I don't have data on the energy it takes to produce that. I think it's still relatively high. But, um, you know, the benefits, I think, can outweigh that. However, it's very costly and it's it's not everywhere. It's only in certain areas like carb states like California and so forth, with which have stations, which and it makes sense from a com from a commercial standpoint. Absolutely. For fleets and stuff, it can make sense. It's a big investment to get into hydrogen. But, you know, multiplying that investment out over a larger fleet can really bring it to very tangible ROI uh, and, and return on that investment and lower your cost of ownership. So I don't think they're here yet. If they are the future, that technology needs to ramp up and get down better. But right now, batteries are here. We're already seeing product out on the roads and we're seeing it even getting better every year to year as new advances happening. So that technology seems to be advancing more rapidly than hydrogen is. So let's have to wait and see. It, I don't think this is a VHS beta thing. I think both can coexist, but right now one is so expensive, much more expensive than the other one that it does, just doesn't make any sense. I think they're both good. Um, batteries explode and it's dangerous is another issue that, that Peter had come across that people are complaining about. Well, yeah, they can be. Batteries are dangerous. Batteries have always been dangerous, whether they're little double A's that you put in your, your remote control or triple A's or car 12 volt car batteries. They have to be dealt with properly at some point. So nothing different with EVs. However, some are less um, dangerous than others. So unfortunately, Tesla has the way that they've engineered their packs and their architecture and their amount of density, energy density in their batteries that if uh, causes them in the chemistry and everything that they, if they, um, are punctured and they get access to oxygen that they do uh, become they, they can greatly chances of becoming on fire and exploding you know successive explosions which you you see then that makes the news which is unfortunate because there are car fires every day <laughs> hundreds if not thousands every day on normal ice cars um, so there is a level of dangerous but other manufacturers i've seen a leaf video where a guy tore apart a pack and took a blowtorch to a pouch and punk you know stabbed it with a screwdriver a million times and it never caught on fire it just sat there so it depends on the design and the chemistries and all this other stuff so not all 
of them are subject to fires and things like that and will explode. Um, there are new, there are no technologies in terms of batteries that can change the future. That's completely wrong. There's stuff happening all the time with solid state and so forth, stuff that I don't even know of. And also, uh, there's another concern that if more EVs on the street, you're going to explode and take down the electric grid. Well, I can tell you that in most areas that have a pretty decent infrastructure of uh, of electric electricity delivery that that is not the case um, i've talked to some elec uh, large electricity providers and they say they could get a million electrified cars on tomorrow and not even feel it so uh, there's a lot of infrastructure now there are some areas that are probably suspect depending on the country and the town and and where you are and also it can go down to the street level with the actual house transformers that cover certain blocks and streets there may be some uh, some issues with some older technologies there that need to be ramped up but be assured that most power companies that are seeing an adoption of electrification within their regions are currently investing in upgrading technology so they can handle that they want your business they don't want you to go to the gas stations and put fuel in your car they want you to charge your car so that they can get the revenue whether they claim they can they they care about the environment or not at the end of the day electric providers electricity providers and retailers are in the business to make money and the only way they're going to make money is to get you to plug in your car so that they can charge you for that while you're charging if you're plugging in, if you're going to get gas, they get nothing out of that. So you're darn right that they are motivated to start ramping up as more and more EVs hit the road. As this hockey stick is happening and continues to happen, we will see more and more electricity providers. If they are in deficiencies in for their grid, they are fixing those if they haven't already. So uh, especially in countries that have heavily adoption and that have incentives for EVs and so forth. So. Thank you very much, Peter, for this. I hope I hope I address some of these concerns. Again, you know, I'm at the mindset that if you talk to somebody and you give them some facts and they totally don't agree with you and they go off and they 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 come to another consensus, even though you've given them some facts, then you just say, thank you very much. Have a nice day. And you go and you talk to the next person that might be interested in the same thing. It's no use to spend your time, effort, energy to convince this one person, no matter what you say or do, that they're never going to accept an EV as an example. And I've, I've tried. I've talked to many people like that. And I've made... Excuse me, I've come to the decision that I'm just not going to take the effort and time to change that one person because there are nine others that are more reasonable out of those 10 that probably want to listen and have a better mind frame to understand. So that's what I would encourage people to do. There's a ton of people out there. There's a ton of knowledge that needs to be spread. And that's what I, why I do what I do by educating minds one tailpipe at a time because here it is, we are at the end of the show already. And thank you very much for the mailbag. So appreciate everybody who wrote in again. And thank you very much for watching. I uh, wanted to remind you Fully Charged Live is coming up very soon. It's a couple of weeks away in the UK. I've got my tickets. I've got my bags half packed. They're still half unpacked from my summer vacation so half full half empty you take it the way you want to uh, but i'm getting ready for fully charged i'm already getting some emails and comments from people that are going to be uh, looking forward to meeting me out there so I'm, I'm very much excited about that i will be there for all three days so please come if you are attending the show please find me hunt me down if you see me introduce yourself tell me your name tell me your story i love to hear it because this is this is ammunition for me right this is fuel for me to continue to do what i do and to be able to talk to people when i hear real life stories i can read news reports and make stuff up on my own but i'd rather report what's going on out there the good the bad and the ugly you know it's not it's not all roses out there so i'd like to hear that but look forward to fully charge and again thank you for for a very humble thank you for patreon supporters that continue to support me i'm always humbled when i uh when i see uh, those monthly patreon things come in um i i just tend to keep focusing and doing what i'm doing and trying to get better a couple exciting things for then this next month it's gonna be a busy month for me because i've got uh, a few uh Video reviews or impressions to do. Uh, I've, I'm in the works of doing my one year review for my Nissan Leaf. I passed the one year mark uh, while I was away on vacation. Um, so I've got all the data and I'm just trying to put that together and I'll do a quick summary. It won't be one of these long winded summary shows. Um, because I, you guys have seen a lot on the leaf, but I do want to give you some feedback on how my year has been and, and also look at it financially with a total cost of ownership. So I think I get a lot of questions about financial sides and total cost of ownership. So I'm going to go through that from my own experience. But I've also next week, I'll be doing some road tripping in one of the Jaguar I-Paces. So I'm excited to get my hands behind a vehicle. I'm actually going 
about, about a thousand, almost a thousand kilometers in that car. I've got to go out of town for business, so I'm going to be driving the Jag for a couple of days, and uh, I'll get some time to do a quick film on that and give you my impressions uh, of that. I mean, there's a ton of reviews, so I don't try to compete. I just try to add my two cents and what I think uh, these cars are like. And very shortly, uh, and around the middle of June, I will have my hands on one of the new Nissan Leaf Pluses. And I'm excited about that because my sole intent on that is to try to rapid charge the crap out of that thing within a short period of time and see really get some definitive temperature and feedback on that because that's really the number one issue that a lot of people are concerned about with the big battery and still passive cooling state. So I am going to probably spend a weekend driving a thousand kilometers or so. I'm gonna go out of town and back a couple of times to really put this thing through its paces and uh, see what, how it holds up. Um, and I will report what I find, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So until next time, thank you very much for watching. As always, I appreciate uh, all your comments and support. And uh, I hope to get uh, back on the weekly weekly take now that I'm here. Uh, it might be a small break as I go to fully charge, of course. I'll be away for a weekend there. But I'll try to keep these more consistent. If you have ideas for shows as well, don't, don't hesitate to send me. I always appreciate Mailbag. And until next time, please, everybody stay safe. And we'll see you. And I'll see you when I see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.